bring before the Lord before we begin. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you be with Miss Marilyn today. Lord, I ask that you would be with her brother David. And I know there's so many others in here, Lord, that need prayer. There's so many around the world that also need prayers. And Lord, I just ask that you would meet with your people, that we would be strengthened in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to continue in our study out of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel um, this morning. We'll be reading two passages again in the book of Revelation, chapter number 17, three verses there, and then Revelation 13, four verses there. <clears throat> Most of our study this morning will be out of the book of Daniel. We will travel to a few other passages uh, one in Habakkuk, the other in Proverbs, uh, Hosea as well. But the majority of our study this morning will be out of the book of Daniel. <clears throat> but in Revelation chapter 17, there's three really important, I believe, verses that are going to help us to understand the book of Daniel. After all, Revelation should be the revealing, or it should be the revealing of Jesus Christ and his plan and what happens in the end times and not a book that should, we should be afraid of or we should um, be afraid to tell others to read. Um, in the beginning chapter, it said, blessed are they that read this book. Um, there's some really important things that we need to look at out of this book as well so that we're not deceived. Because Jesus in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, he says, Be not deceived, there will be many that come in my name. There are many that profess to be Christ. And he says, don't follow them. So we need to be able to have sound doctrine, because if not, we could just be carried all over the place with false doctrines and teachings. And what I believe the big downfall of many of those false teachings, it'll scare the daylights out of most of you. You know, people get caught up in a false teaching and it ends up causing you to have high anxiety, fear. And next thing you know, you're running into the grocery store and you're buying all the toilet paper up. And the normal people who aren't afraid can't buy any. So we need to keep that in mind um, when we go through Bible prophecy. Revelation 17, verse number 9, the Bible reads, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Many versions of the Bibles now change mountains to hills, and that's a false teaching. It is a mountain, and we've gone over that a mountain is a kingdom. And we know that there are seven kingdoms on which the woman sitteth. There are seven world empires, right? I think I've made that clear over the last several weeks. And there are seven kings, and these seven kings back up the seven mountains because every king has a kingdom. He doesn't have a hill. And there is no city with seven hills where the Antichrist is going to rule from. That is a false teaching. Now, that being said, there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. That means five kings, five kingdoms have fallen before John is on the Isle of Patmos. And what this means is one is in place right now. One of the world empire, empires at this time in human history is in power. That's the one that is. That's the Rome, Romans. And the other is not yet come, which means there's the seventh. The seventh hasn't come yet, and today it still hasn't come. All right? But when he does come, he, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Or destruction. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. I believe repetition is the key to learning. I believe that the reason why I'm going over these verses multiple times before I begin is that we need to nail these down in our heart because there's a lot of false doctrine. There's a lot of guys making a lot of money off of a lot of good people selling books and tapes and different things. And we need to be able to take our Bible and discern the truth from fiction. 
Revelation 13, verse number 1, the Bible reads, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Every, relig every kingdom, even up to the seventh, is a blasphemous kingdom against God. In one way or another, every one of these kingdoms blasphemed the Lord, starting in Egypt with Pharaoh who said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And then it goes on to the Assyrians in the book of Nahum. God calls them a bloody city. God hates violence. The Bible says violence his soul hateth. God hates violence. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, very prideful, Pride. Pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. The devil is prideful, right? And then we go on to our next two that we're going to learn about today. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Doesn't mean he's a leopard. It means he's like a leopard. He's going to have characteristics of a leopard. We're going to find out what those are this morning. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. Doesn't say his feet were bare feet, although a lot of people throughout history have had some pretty bearish looking feet, right? <laughs> <I've seen laughs> They've had some really strong feet. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your words this morning and not mine. Lord, that we would be able to discern the word of God based on the word of God, dividing spiritual with spiritual, and your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts, that it would be your words this morning and not mine. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the next two kingdoms, I'm putting them together. The lion was distinct in the fact that he was the greatest. He was probably the strongest of all. That's why he was the so-called head of gold. Many of us in here know this already. We're going to review it here shortly in a minute. But I'm going to focus my study this morning on the bear and the leopard because these two kind of are synonymous and go hand in hand. Now, what I want you to notice is one of them, and many people associate a bear with power, power, right? I mean, if you've ever seen any of the big polar bears or grizzly bears, even the way they swim across the water, they are very graceful, but they're very powerful. You just see such power in the size of a bear, right? I mean, when you see these bears out there in the wild and what they're able to do, and when a bear goes up against another bear, you just you can just feel the strength and the power, can you not? I mean, when you watch these two go at it, or you watch a bear in another animal go at it, you see such great strength. Now, the leopard, on the other hand, when you view a leopard and you see a leopard, the one thing that goes along with a leopard is the fact that they're a smaller cat, but they're a cat nonetheless. And they're very fast, and they're very cunning, and they seem to come out of nowhere. These are a few points that I'm bringing up this morning because these are really important to lay the foundation of what Daniel calls in Daniel chapter 2, the, the image which he sees. These two are weaker than the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar or the lion. So turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 2. We will not be going back to Revelation. So keep a mark in Daniel chapter 2 as we go through this book because we will cross reference a few other passages out of Proverbs, Hosea, and Habakkuk this morning. But in Daniel chapter number 2, Daniel. Obviously, if you don't know the story, he's, he's one of the children of the Babylonian captivity. He's an Israelite that was taken captive. And Daniel and his friends, they end up defying the king by not eating the king's meat. So they found special favor in God. What did they do? They resisted the government. Why? Because God's power was the ultimate power and authority. And they were not going to defile themselves with the king's meat or the king's drink. Why? Because it was probably worshipped 
and, and they probably sacrificed it unto devils. And Daniel was going to keep his heart pure, and he was going to keep his mind pure. And even though the government and the rulers said, hey, you're going to do what we say, he said, basically, Daniel says, no, let me try it God's way and see if we don't look better than everybody else. Now, here's the thing. When you do it God's way, you're always going to come out on top, no matter what. It may look like dark days in the beginning. It may look like you're going to struggle. But let me tell you, in the end, I guarantee you, you'll look better than everybody else in the end. Now, that being said, Daniel, because of this, because he set his heart in the right place at the right time in the very beginning, God revealed to Daniel many things in his word. Now, Daniel is able to interpret dreams, and the first one he gets is from the king himself. I want you to notice this in Daniel chapter number 2 that there's, the king has a dream, and the king can't remember the dream. And he's basically calling out all the great teachers, scholars, soothsayers, people that are supposed to have all the answers. He calls them out and he basically says he's going to put them to death if they can't interpret this. But now I want to pick up in verse number 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make unto me... Unto, unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof. So the king's asking Daniel, hey, are you going to be able to interpret this thing or not? I like how Daniel calls out all the false preachers and wise men of the day. See, people criticize pastors and preachers for calling out people from the pulpit. But Daniel starts by saying, hey, the secret which the king demanded, cannot the wise men, cannot your most scholarly guys tell you the interpretation of the dream? Cannot your best guys tell you? Cannot the guys who spent their whole life devoted to books, don't they have any knowledge at all? The astrologers, come on, they're looking at the stars, the sky. They're checking out all the seasons. Don't they have all the answers? And the magicians, the soothsayers, Show unto the king. Look, can't your best of the best, can't your elite guys who they, they think they know everything and have all the answers, can't they interpret the dream? But the answer is no. And Daniel goes on to say in verse 28, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. You know, the book of Revelation should not be a secret. The book of Daniel should not be a secret. Matter of fact, your entire Bible should not be a secret. God put this book here for us to learn and grow and understand. Just because you don't have all the answers right away to everything in this book, don't get frustrated, don't quit, don't throw in the towel. God doesn't want to unload everything to you all at once. Why? Because you can't handle it. I guarantee you, you can't handle it. Because King Solomon in Ecclesiastes verse 118 says, to whom much wisdom is given is, is much sorrow and heaviness of heart. I'll tell you right now, the more I read this book, the more I see the depravity of some people, the more I see the fallen nature of man, the more I see what's coming down the line, what's happening to people, the deceptions, the things they're falling into, the things that are destroying their lives, it breaks my heart. I think to myself, oh God, if everybody could just see if everybody could just hear, if everybody could just turn their life around, but they won't. And that is where the heaviness and the sorrow comes in. Because no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you plead, there's going to be those that just will not listen to you no matter what. And therefore, heaviness and sorrow comes in. But God reveals the secrets. Let's continue reading. And maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into my, unto thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Get this. Daniel knows where the power comes from. But as for me... This secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. And that's what we need to remember from the pulpits. The things in the Bible that we're revealing is not given to me. Not any extra wisdom that I have. It's just so that I, what? I can help others. That's what the Bible says. But for their sakes, that shall make known 
the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. The truth of the matter is, I have no power of prophecy or interpretation of God's word above anybody else in this room today. Now, God's given me, I believe, a gift of being able to speak and teach, and I'm not afraid to stand up in front of others. But the truth of the matter is, every one of us, if we give our heart over to God, hey, we can understand these things. We can interpret the scriptures. But what we need to do is cut out all the outside rhetoric, rhetoric from all the wise men. All the people you think are smarter than you because they're not. See, every one of us was created in the image of God. So every one of us has knowledge and understanding. Plus, you actually have a secret weapon that many wise people don't have. You have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. Read it in 1 John chapter number 1. The Holy Spirit, you have no need that any man teach you, for the Holy Spirit teaches you everything. But you have to give yourself over to understanding and reading. Verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was of fine gold. I'm going to stop right there because we know that the, Im the head of the image is Nebuchadnezzar. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go back into him. But I want to focus on verse number 32, and this is what I want to focus on. And his arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass. Now, skip on down to verse number 37. Verse number 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, hath he given into thy hand and hath made thee ruler over them all, thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, right? He's the lion. Now, I want you to notice something, and this is what kind of intrigued me. Verse 39, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over, the all, over all the earth. Both of the next two kingdoms are going to bear rule over the entire earth. They are world empires. But what we want to notice here is they are inferior to Nebuchadnezzar. See, Nebuchadnezzar ruled the entire earth with absolute power. But these two, even though they have attributes that the Antichrist will have, these two next kingdoms, the bear and the leopard, are actually much weaker than the ones prior to it. And that, to me, kind of symbolizes how man's earthly kingdom isn't getting stronger. Men are not getting better. They're getting worse. And their corruption and the way they're doing things as leaders in the world is not getting better. We're not getting better as a nation, honestly. We're not getting better as a world community, right? We're getting worse. The depravity of man, the reprobates that are starting to take over the entire world, people that are rejecting God, God at an alarming rate. I've brought up the statistics many times before, and I'm telling you right now, man's not getting better, he's getting worse. Because in my mind, growing up for many years when I read Revelation, I'm reading Revelation chapter 8, and I'm re reading Revelation chapter 15 and 16, and parts of number 19, and the Bible says, as God's pouring out his wrath, that they repented not of their sorceries, of their murders, of their thefts, as God's trying with one last stitch of everything he can to get their attention, they repent not. And I used to think, how in the world could nobody see this? How in the world are they going to fall for all these wickedness? And the truth is, the, the more we start to look down the, the time capsule of time, we're seeing how people are starting to become reprobate, to where they'll reach that point, to where when something bad happens, the first person they blame is God, right? God, why did you let that happen to me? God, why did you let that pedophile get me? God, why did you let that person kill my spouse? God, why did you let them get cancer? Not, Lord, please forgive me. Help me through this. It's God. Why is it your fault? 
And we're starting to see that today, are we not? See, man's getting a lot worse. He's not getting better. And the kingdoms of this earth are starting to show that it's inferior because in Nebuchadnezzar's day, I don't believe he was saved. Some people would debate that. I think he knew who God was, but I don't think he had a personal relationship with God. But even Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, even when in the instance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, hey, when Daniel reveals the dreams, he says there is a God in heaven. But I want you to notice that every kingdom after that, there's no more mention of God at all in regards to these kingdoms. Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Persian, they kind of glance over it, you know, from the lion's den, but it gets worse. It gets more inferior to where there's no, no uh, recognition for God whatsoever. And I truly believe as the world gets worse, many of the nations of the world are starting to push God out of everything. That's why there's 1.1 billion agnostics and atheists in the world today and non-religious. I guarantee you there's even more than that. That being said, lesser kings and lesser kingdoms is it being handed over. Daniel chapter 7. Turn to Daniel chapter 7. And I'll show you why these kingdoms are getting weaker. Verse number 4 I don't need to go over the other verses. We did. Verse number four talks about the lion and how he had eagle's wings and they were plucked out. That was when Nebuchadnezzar had his mind removed and he went to live with the beast and his fingernails and his hair grew like that of eagle's feathers. I mean, we don't have to go reread that. That's what the Bible says. But the difference between his kingdom and now the lesser kingdoms is this. Verse number five, and behold another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, arise and devour much flesh. The difference between Nebuchadnezzar and these other kings is what we're going to start to see. There are now four kingdoms coming up in the bear. There are going to be four lesser and lesser and lesser leaders. And where Nebuchadnezzar was mentioned as the lion, as the absolute authority, as the head of brass, what makes these next kingdoms weaker is the ones that come after him. Kind of like when Barack Obama was elected into office, right? or something of that nature. America's not stronger when you elect someone who wants to deny Jesus Christ and wants to deny and kill babies in the womb and wants to support the White House being turned into a rainbow flag. Uh, this is when you start to weaken a nation, right? This is when the nation gets weaker. So when you allow certain people to come in that are weaker, then your kingdom is less and it's more inferior. And I'll tell you right now, you know, America, we're strongest when our military's strong, right? We need a strong military. That's more obvious today than ever before. And we spend $750 plus billion dollars a year on our military, which is more than the next 10 nations combined will spend on their military. Did you know that? Most people aren't aware of that fact. They are different, though, each one of these kings or each one of these leaders that come up after him. The lion, he ruled with absolute authority, but the bear, he doesn't quite rule with absolute authority. Why? Because he's arms. He's part of a two-part kingdom, the Medo-Persians. Now, I found this to be interesting, and, it's one, of, and, and one of the downfalls of a kingdom and what makes, I believe, the bear's kingdom lesser of a kingdom than Nebuchadnezzar, is, the, is this one simple fact. Turn to Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. <clears throat> See, I don't think anything's in the Bible by accident, coincident, or as an incident. Because everything should be in here and for a reason that should strengthen what we believe. And I thank God that we actually have a complete Bible today, which allows us to be able to discern the truth from fiction. Starting in Proverbs 28, verse 15, this will sound familiar to many of you. As a roaring lion, lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. You know, it's wicked for 
governments of the world like they do over in Africa today and around many parts of the world to keep their people in poverty. We, um, the Muslims and Islam is a wicked religion because it keeps the heads of the government in money and power and it, it keeps those underneath it poor and destitute, right? Many of, of the African people today, look, they're starving to death because their governments aren't giving them the aid that we're sending them. Did you know that? I mean, how many videos, how many things do you need to see? How many reports do you need to hear that when a UN truck or, or, or some food pantry sends food to Africa, that the warlords and the people in authority hijack those things and they, they oh yeah, they just give them to all the poor people because they want to make sure everybody's taken care of? No, they're covetous and they hold it and pour it and keep it under themselves. Verse number 16, the prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor but he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days many of the reasons why these kingdoms fall is because of covetousness because they're desiring to obtain the riches and goods of other kingdoms that's why these two tie together the bear and the leopard and you're going to see that in a minute see it's we should hate covetousness you know thou shalt not covet right why? Because we should be thankful and content with what things God gives us, right? Whether we have or whether we have not, God's given it to us, and we should be thankful for it, Amen. right? We should be content. Now turn back to Daniel chapter 7. Now, unlike the lion which God had to punish, the bear is a lesser kingdom, and he kind of punishes himself. Keeping that verse in Proverbs, he that is covetous shall not prolong his days. That is timeless, and whether you're a king or just a regular Christian who has a little bit of money tied up in a 401k, and you have a small pension, and you're happy to be alive, don't be covetous. Do not be covetous. Just be thankful for what God's given you and what he's blessed you with. Look, because great is your reward in heaven right? We don't need to worry about what everybody else has. And I'll tell you something, you'd probably be miserable just like most of the wealthy people I know. Their kids don't talk to them. All they want is their money. Uh, and if you're in Hollywood, half of them are drug addicted, fornicating adulterers who are never going to find happiness no matter how hard they try in finding it in their own covetousness of themselves and money and wealth. They're never going to find it. Just like Robin Williams who hung himself. Why? He was miserable at the end of the day. At the end of the day, he had all the money. He had all the name and fame, right? Uh, he had everything. And yet one of the, what is so-called the funniest men in, men in Hollywood ends up hanging himself. Why? Because he sought the wrong thing. He sought the gold of this earth. And it is better to have a good name than choice silver or gold, right? It's better for you to have a good name and for you to be a good person and a good Christian who loves others. Not to covet things that are just going to pass away. That's not what we want to go after is silver and gold like he did. At the end of the day, it'll leave you high and dry. Now, how these two tie together, the bear and the leopard, let's turn in our Bible to Daniel chapter number 8. So in my Bible, it's just flipping one page to Daniel 8. Now, for a while, this, this seemed like a very hard passage for me to interpret and try to figure out because I had been kind of corrupted by some of the other prophecy books that I had read at the time. So when I'm talking against people who produce a lot of prophecy books, I'm only doing it because I fell for it and I got deceived. And I started to believe in all kinds of crazy things of nations and different things. So look, he who thinketh he to stand, take heed lest he fall. Okay? We need to be really careful not to puff ourselves up. So in num verse number one of chapter eight, the Bible says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, uh, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So he's talking about a dream way back when. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Ulai. 
Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw a ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And I'm thinking to myself, is a ram that powerful? More powerful than a lion, more powerful than a bear, more powerful than a leopard, more powerful than a tiger. I'm thinking to myself, how could a ram be so powerful? But see, here's the thing. A ram has a very thick head and he has two horns and he's able to just butt into things. Now, I'm not saying he's powerful, more powerful than those beasts. But the symbol here, if we just hold our place here and go to verse number 19 then we know what the Bible is going to say on who this is. Because at first, this can get somewhat confusing. But in chapter 8, verse number 19, the Bible reads, And he said, this is Gabriel, the angel, given the interpretation of the dream, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Meda and Persia. Medo-Persian Empire, the bear. So the importance of seeing this and the importance of this being broken down is the fact that God wants us to know that the bear or the empire of the bear is a two-part kingdom, which is less inferior than Nebuchadnezzar, who's an archetype of the Antichrist, right? He's one of the seven heads. This head is actually weaker than the first head. Right, But he's symbolized as a ram that can go everywhere and just destroy everything, right? Because it's a two-part kingdom. <clears throat> and it's the Medo-Persians. Now, the thing is this. Turn to, um, turn to, uh, hold on one sec. Uh, eight, one, four, four, four. Uh, verse number 15 through 20, I just read those, but um, I want you to notice verse 21. And the rough goat, now there's going to be a rough goat of the king of Grecia. All right, now, that being said, I'm going to go back to verse number 5 of the same chapter. See, this is the interpretation. Let's use the interpretation to show the meaning of the vision. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, verse number five. And as I was considering before, uh, behold, a he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and, the, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with cholera against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now that can get very confusing, right? I mean, goats, rams, he-goats, horn, multiple horns, things going up unto heaven. But here's the thing. Just keep this in mind. There's an inferior king always coming up, but he always bests the one in front of him. See, even though Nebuchadnezzar was a king that ra absolute, uh, ran his kingdom with absolute authority, guess what? His son takes office after him. And his son is wicked, and he's defiling the, the temple instruments. And so therefore, the Medo- Persians come in and judge Babylon. And just like Babylon was in power, the Medo-Persians come in. And the Medo-Persians get wicked. And there's some things that they do that are extremely wicked. And then all of a sudden, here comes the Grecians. Because there's always a bigger brother. There's always someone who can come to the fight that's bigger, faster, and stronger than you. Hey, for years, people thought Mike Tyson was unbeatable. Then out of nowhere came a Buster Douglas. Hey, I'm telling you right now, just when you think think you're invincible, there's always someone that can
can beat you. There's always someone that knows more than you. And the whole point of what I'm teaching in this part so far is that when we get into the part of Babylon, Babylon the Great thinks that there's no way. It sits alone as a queen. No one can conquer the final kingdom. No one can destroy it. But let me tell you something. There's a God in heaven who's a great mountain, and his mountain will cover the entire earth. Let me tell you, God's coming, and he's going to set things straight. <clears throat> now, this is not the easiest subject to teach because I'm putting two in one to prove a point. But what I'm going to say is this. Now comes the brass belly and the thighs, which is the Grecians. Okay? If we think back to the statue, we had a head of gold. We had arms and breasts of silver, and now we have a brass belly and thighs. So what we have is Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Then we have the Medo-Persians. Then we have Alexander the Great and the Grecians. And I find that this should be a lesson to everyone why we should not try to be like the bear. Because when we become like the bear, there are others that will look to us for things that we have. How many people look to America right now for financial help? How many people are looking to America to lead the way, right? How many people are looking to our president and our nation for advice, guidance, and leadership around the world, right? Just about everyone. And America, whether we've liked it or not, for many years after World War II, we've been placed in that position. And now as the world's lone superpower, and make no mistake, we have no military rival on the battlefield, people say, what about China and mustering up 100 million men with rifles, and they could have 100 million men? Let me tell you something right now. The reason why America was not invaded, the reason why we're celebrating Memorial Day today is not just because of our great military strength but it's the people America has the largest standing army in the entire world that's the US citizen and if we give up our right to keep and bear arms we'll be overran the whole reason why Japan would never have attacked us during World War II is their leading general said if I were to attack America I would find a rifle behind every blade of grass there are 85 million registered gun owners and there are probably 210 million guns in America. How many are not registered? Do you think that we can sit here and say, hey, China, they're a threat to us. They wouldn't make it past California. Period. We have no military equal. None on the battlefield. The technology that America has placed in the hand of the average soldier is astronomical. The smart bullets, the different weapons that are coming into place. But I'll tell you this, if America isn't careful, America can be just like every one of these kingdoms. We allow and push God out of the way, we're in trouble. Amen. We are in big trouble. Think back to what I read in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 15 and 16 about covetous. And turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. <clears throat> Verses number 2 and 3. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. Those are the three ribs in the mouth of the bear. And the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up against, uh, up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So what happened here? What happened? The bear got greedy. And as he started to control, he hoarded up wealth. He was very powerful, the fourth one. There were three ribs. There were three other kings in this empire, but yet these three kings were not as strong as the fourth, as the bear actually was. But in becoming strong, just like America, we could be stirring up another enemy, just like they did. Grisha, the leopard. Now quickly, for the sake of time, turn to Hosea chapter 13. 
Hosea 13. I'm not going to read it all, but I want you to notice something. It's actually the next book in your Bible from Daniel turned right. Hosea chapter 13. I had many more verses to read. The first six verses deal with I'm going to read, I'm going to start in verse number six, but it talks about covetousness and putting idols and worshiping silver and gold. And in verse six, it says, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Hey, listen to me right now. We need not exalt our heart when God blesses us. We need to stay humble. We need to realize who gives us the finances, where our gifts actually come from. Therefore, they have forgotten me. Verse 7, therefore I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard by the way, I will observe him. And that's what Alexander did as a leopard. He watched and waited. He waited for that he goat to just gallop around and conquer everybody and take their wealth. They did the hard work for him. And then Alexander comes in and takes away everything. Because he who coveteth covetousness shall not prolong his days and that was the demise of this fourth bear as this leopard comes on because why he was watching that's what it said in daniel chapter 11 he stirred up by his riches the king of grecia the leopard and the leopard is one of the crafty hunters because most of the time they're by themselves lions hunt in a pack right but the leopard will sit and watch his prey, sometimes for days, to find out its weakness. And then it'll pounce. But you know what? Let's look at a New Testament application. We got a few minutes. Turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. This ought to be a lesson to us. See, when we start putting things before God and we start hoarding and holding on to things, and not relying on God, and we start holding up all this treasure, then we know we're in, we're in a problem. Chapter 4, verse number 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. You want to know why so many wars are started? Right there. Because too many people are just like the leopard. Too many nations are like a leopard. They're watching what the others have. And they want to come in and get it. They want to come in and get it. I had a few other verses backing this up. But I want you, I'm just going to go ahead and say it since we know what it is. The truth of the matter is, when the Bible talks about Alexander the Great coming in chapter 8, verse number 5, with such speed... The Bible says that that goat touched not the ground. And if we take that application and apply it to the seventh head coming out of the sea, when the Antichrist does come on the scene, because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, it says he comes down with wrath because he knows he has a short time. He doesn't have all day. He doesn't have a whole bunch of years. He doesn't have a lifetime. What he has is a short time. And when he comes down, he'll take over with speed. He'll cross this earth and this planet and he'll do it with such speed and ferocity no one will stand in his way. Why? Because he'll also have the strength of the bear back in him. And he'll also have the mouth and the deception of the lion. He'll also control the food like the Egyptian king. He'll also be violent and bloody and torturing and cutting the heads off of tribulation saints and those that are here. He's going to be nasty. And we haven't even got to the Roman one yet. He's going to end up destroying and moving with speed and power like no one has ever seen. Why? Because he doesn't have a 20-year time to do this. He's got a very short time. And that's why when, when John is standing on the Isle of Patmos and he sees the beast rise, and why Daniel, when he has the dream and he sees the beast rise, what's he see? He sees power and strength and speed. And that's the lesson we need to learn. We need to learn as Christians that if we're going to fight, we need to be fast. We need to stop sitting around and get up and get into the fourth quarter of this game and do something while there's still something left to do. 
Because there's coming a time when the darkness will hit and you'll be done working. And whoever's left here will be left to fend for themselves. And it'll be our fault. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for everything you've given us, the many blessings, Lord. We ask that you would continue to bless and meet the needs of the people of this church and look after us, Lord. I ask that you would be with our pastor as he brings the message. In Jesus' name, amen.